be made. Huh? Kind of segue just a little bit. We have one week left. The foundation is taking grant requests. Um, and we are meeting November 5th to review the uh, grant requests that have come in. So if you are so motivated, give a shout. We'll get to the application within each week. Which foundation is that, Todd? Our Sarasota Rotary. Okay. Our own personal okay. foundation. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Well, we have two awesome speakers today. First is Dr. Tom Becker. He received his PhD in Industrial Organizational Psychology from The Ohio State University. He's currently a professor of management at the University of South Florida, Sarasota Manatee, where he teaches courses and conducts research in the areas of organizational behavior and human resource management. He has published many articles in scientific journals on the topics of employee commitment, motivation, research methods, and job performance. His awards for teaching, research, and service are so many that I'm not going to take time to mention them all because it would take half their time. But um, Tom has recently become interested in the topic of human resilience, particularly the resilience of U.S. veterans. Together with professors Eric Hodge, Hodges and Ram Govindu, Get that right? Mm -hmm. He started the USFSM Veterans Research Coalition, a group devoted to improving the lives of veterans in the area. Tom is here today to discuss a current study on that topic. And with him is Dr. Eric Hodges, who is an assistant professor at political science at the University of Florida, Sarasota Manatee. Prior to obtaining his PhD, he enlisted in the US Marine Corps, which, provided, which proved to be transformational. Based on his experience as a Marine and as a veteran, Dr. Hodges researches ways to improve the quality of life for veterans and their families. Dr. Hodges has presented and published on these topics at various conferences and in several publications, including a TED Talk titled, The Moral Injury of War. In 2015, he was awarded a $150,000 grant by the National Endowment for the Humanities to study how we can help current veterans by looking at our history. Dr. Hodges is the director of the newly formed USFSM Veterans Research Coalition. Uh, welcome to both of them, and thank you for being here. So is it okay if I walk around? Or do I just stay do it. Okay, all right. So I was telling some of the ladies in the back that I have a newborn and a three-year-old, so if I fall asleep during the presentation, you guys, you guys will have an understanding of why, why that's going on. But thank you all for, for having us here today. I do feel very welcome. I think you guys might be the most friendly club that, that I've ever presented at, so I feel good about that. What about sunrise? Um, so I wanted to get started this morning uh, by sharing a story of a local veteran that I know. His name is Brian Jacobs, and some of you may know him. Gene, I don't know if you're familiar with Brian, but so I first met Brian when he was a student at USFSM. Uh, I had just arrived, and I had announced that I was conducting a research project on veterans in the area. And Brian heard about the project, and uh, he came to share his story with me. So Brian was a Navy corpsman. And for those of you who aren't familiar, a Navy corpsman is a medic that's attached to a Marine Corps combat unit. They also have one of the shortest life expectancies of anybody in combat, around 30 seconds when the bullets start flying, as you could imagine. They're sort of out there in the danger zone treating wounded soldiers and Marines. Uh, Brian was deployed to Iraq twice in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom. Um, he served in the bloodiest battle in Iraq, uh, the Second Battle of Fallujah, where he was awarded the Navy Commendation Medal. Uh, for his service. Um, but after his two combat tours, Brian decided it was time for him to get out. He, he had essentially seen enough. And the way that he explained it to me was that uh, when he got home, there was no parade, there was no welcome home party. Essentially, it was just a week's worth of paperwork and out processing, and he was out. So when Brian got out, the only job that he qualified for uh, was drawing blood at LabCorp as, as a phlebotomist. So you can imagine the difference between going from saving lives in a combat zone in Iraq to drawing blood in lab corps on a, on a daily basis. And Brian said that he felt like he had lost his sense of purpose. Right? But not only did he lose his sense of purpose, he also lost his sense of community. Because as, as you're aware, in, in the military, there are very strong bonds of camaraderie that are created, especially when somebody's serving in a, in a combat, combat situation. So Brian had lost his sense of purpose. He had lost his community. And to fill that gap of community that, that he had lost when he got out, 
he did what most of us would do and he got married, right? So he was trying to fill that gap, the, the loneliness that he felt by getting married. Uh, but he explained it to me that he got married for the wrong reasons. Right? It wasn't because he was looking to build a new life, it was because he was trying to fill a gap that he had lost in his previous life. So as you can imagine, when you get married for the wrong reasons, things typically don't work out too well. Right? So within a year, Brian was divorced. So within a year, Brian had lost a sense of community, he'd lost a sense of purpose, uh, he'd gotten a divorce, right? You would think that things would be pretty much rock bottom from there. Unfortunately, things get worse for Brian because Brian depended upon his wife for his house. He was living with his house, with his wife on base housing. So when he got divorced, he also lost his home. So Brian was homeless at that point and spent the next uh, six months living under the Hampton Bay Bridge in his car. So he lost his sense of purpose, he had lost his community, he got divorced, and now he, he was homeless. Um, unfortunately, things get even worse for Brian from there. Because Brian, had a, he had a brother who was a Marine, and he was also deployed to Iraq in support of a couple of, of combat tours. And he, he decided to get out as well. But unfortunately, when Brian's brother got out, he suffered from a lot of the same issues that Brian was facing, uh, but he wasn't able to withstand those, those difficulties, and he ended up committing suicide. Right, so his brother became one of the 21 veterans that killed themselves every day. So as you can imagine, Brian was devastated. Uh, he went back to his home to, to go to his, his brother's funeral. Um, and he was going through his brother's room looking at some of his things when he came across his brother's uh, unit coin. I'm not sure if you're aware or not, but each military unit has a coin that's associated with that unit that has a slogan that goes along with it that's supposed to be representative of that particular unit. And Brian's brother's coin, his unit coin, their slogan was, my brother's keeper. So you can imagine when Brian read that slogan, you know, it hit him like a ton of bricks because he felt like he had failed in being his brother's keeper. So at that point, Brian decided that he was going to turn his life around. Um, you know, there are a couple of ways you can go from there. You can spiral downwards or you can go back up. And Brian decided to, to take steps to go back up. So Brian went back to school. He got his culinary degree. Uh, he became a private chef for the Anheuser-Busch uh, family. And he started a nonprofit organization called Bets to Chef, which is operating here in the, in the local area, where Brian takes uh, local homeless or disadvantaged veterans, he provides them with housing, and he provides them with a curriculum to teach them how to be a chef so they can you know, get some, some job skills and get back into the, into the labor force. And over the past three years, Brian has graduated over 50 veterans uh, from this program really amazing amazing program so I share that story because I think it highlights a couple of things that are important for the research study that we're doing one it talks about some of the challenges and the adversity that veterans face when they get out the other point of it that we're looking at is resilience right and I would say that Brian and his brother could be a good case study in the question of resilience right because Brian obviously demonstrated resilience and overcoming the difficulties that his face he faced and his brother did not uh, for for whatever reason uh, okay, so here we are. Uh, this is our group. We're the USFSM Research Coalition. We formed this coalition in response to requests that we're getting from the community to conduct research, evidence-based research into some of the, the issues that local veterans are facing. Uh, there's myself, there's Tom, uh, Carl Hunsinger, he's the chairman of the Manatee County Veterans Council, Ram Gabendu, Carlos, who is our local veteran service provider, and we have a couple of uh, student assistants as well. We also have a community steering group. Right now, the organization is focused in Manatee County because that, the first request came to us from Manatee County, but we're looking into the other areas as well. We, we're hoping to extend the study into Sarasota and other local areas. So a few statistics about uh, veterans' transition, right? So the risk for suicide is 22% higher among veterans than, than non-veteran adults. <coughs> Uh, around 21 a day. An interesting statistic is that more veterans die on a yearly basis than have died in the 17 years that we've been in combat in Iraq and Afghanistan. So around 7,000 commit suicide uh, every year. And that's about how many have died in the past 17 years in Iraq and Afghanistan. There are about 40,000 veterans who are homeless on any given night. Uh, this is especially a problem for female veterans. The, the ratio of female veterans to civilians who are homeless is, I think, something like 10 to 1, something like that. So that's, that's really becoming a major issue. 
About 20% of veterans who served in Iraq or Afghanistan suffer from depression or PTSD, and about 20% uh, have experienced a traumatic brain injury. Of course, it's worth pointing out that that means that 80% of vets don't have PTSD, right? Oftentimes, the discourse around veterans is focused on the negatives, PTSD, TBI, things like that. But the truth is a lot of these guys are doing well, so it's important to keep that in mind when we're, when we're thinking about these issues. At this time. Right, right. Unemployment rate for veterans is slightly higher than the overall population, and about 41% of Gulf War era veterans have a service-connected disability. So why are we here today? We're here to talk about this project that we're conducting uh, in Manatee County right now, which is looking at the current quality of life issues that veterans are facing in our area and trying to see how resilient they are and whether resilience actually impacts their ability to respond to these, these challenges that they face. Tom's gonna to talk more about, about how we're gonna manage those particular things. And our hope at the end of the day, we're not just doing this study just for scientific purposes. Our hope is to improve the quality of life for veterans in our area. Um, some of the potential benefits from our study include increased employment opportunities, better housing, social relationships, and improved mental health of the men and women who have served in the military. And we're also looking at the family members as well. Uh, that's another important dimension to consider. So some key discussion points, and we're going to run through this presentation pretty quickly, but we want, it, we want this to, to develop into a, a conversation between us and to get your perspectives on what we can do to make this project successful. So at the end of the day, we're giving out surveys and we're interviewing people. If people don't respond to our surveys, we can't make any valid conclusions. So the key is getting the word out about our survey and encouraging people to take it because we all get hundreds of surveys and most of them end up in the trash, right? So how do we make sure that that's not the case in this particular, this particular study? I'm gonna... Thank you. Right, so when Eric uh, asked me to get involved in this project, I was fascinated right away because I've been doing some work on the topic of uh, employee resilience. I mean, resilience is something that is relevant whenever people are under a degree of adversity, and that would be just about all of us at one time or another. Um, but this seemed like a great opportunity to, to, to study a sample of people who could really benefit um, from our understanding more about the link between resilience, uh, adversity, and quality of life. So I just wanted to take a couple of minutes and tell you a little bit about the, the study itself. There's two aspects to the study. The focus group part uh, is just about over. So we've been talking to a number of groups of veterans from different areas geographically and from different walks of life. One of the more interesting ones was a few weeks ago, uh, Eric uh, and I met with a group of homeless veterans, that is, veterans who would be homeless if they weren't at Vets Village. Anybody know where Vets Village is? It's a couple of uh, miles north of the university, uh, at north of the airport, if you don't know where the university is. Uh, and the interesting thing about that group, I thought, was uh, they weren't in any way obviously different from the other groups of vets that we've been talking to. It wasn't like you sat down with these people and was like, oh, they just don't have their act together or they don't care or whatever. They were, they were as articulate and intelligent as any of the other vets we were talking about. So we were really interested to find out from them, you know, what sorts of things happened that you would say contributed to your being here. We met with a group of all female veterans, and they had their own stories, very different from uh, those of the male veterans. And the reason we were doing these focus groups was to try to build a survey that was really relevant to the vets, not just something we're dreaming up out of our head. Right? So we put together a survey. I don't know if you know anything about uh, what you have to go through at a university to get uh, research approved, but there's this group, the Institutional Review Board, and it's for a very good reason. They want to make sure that people who are involved in studies are treated respectfully and their data is kept confidential and things of that nature. So Eric put together the whole package, we went through that several times, revising, re-revising, and finally got it approved about a week and a half ago. Uh, and about that same time, we got approval uh, from the Veterans Administration to do a broader study, uh, survey study, of veterans in the area. 
as Eric mentioned, we started at Man in Manatee, and we're still focusing on Manatee, but this database that they gave us, list of email addresses and names, uh, included 118,000 people uh, in the area. And we were like, uh, to be honest with you, I was salivating. It was like, wow, that's a huge <coughs> sample of people. Uh, and a lot of times you gotta go to a lot of work to get a large sample of people, and we just had it handed to us, so we were very grateful about that. So we just sent out, let, one week ago today, we just sent out um, a email with the survey on it, and to this point we've received responses from about uh, 1,300 veterans in the area. Uh, and I just wanna highlight two points about the study that we think makes it particularly useful. So we've got that data for our vets right now. We're going back to them in March or April to get a second wave of data. Now I don't want to get all egghead on you about why that's exciting, but the reason it's exciting to us essentially is that you have more than just a snapshot of people. And if I took a picture of you right now, there's a snapshot, that's what they're doing right now. That tells us nothing about what you're doing in a week, a month, a year. Right? So being able to go back at a second point in time lets us track how behavior and attitudes change over time and also gives us a little bit of insight into whether um, something like resilience affects the quality of life of people. So we measure resilience, for example, time one, what's our quality of life at time two? That allows us to you know, be a little more clear about which came first, the chicken or the egg kind of thing. So that's one exciting thing about the project. The second part that I wanted to mention was we're getting data from family members of veterans too. Now, the reason why that's important is vets, like anybody else, have one perspective of themselves and their behavior and why they do what they do. Um, I don't want to get too personal, but you know, I think I'm just the greatest guy with no flaws whatsoever. But if you ask my wife, <laughs> <laughs> Not quite so rosy. So the idea is, for example, a veteran might say, yeah, I got back uh, and it was tough, you know, going through some difficult times uh, uh, while I was uh, uh, while I was at war, but I got back and I'm doing good as he reaches for a bottle. You ask his spouse or significant other or you know, sibling or family, other family member, and they go, thinks he's doing well, but really not so great. So we really think having the family member perspective is going to help us to see, you know, kind of a reality test uh, of what the veterans uh, are saying about their own level of resiliency and the quality of their life, specifically uh, their physical health, their mental health, the development of their social relationships, and their environment. You already talked a little bit about that, Eric. So I really wanted to get to this last slide. So the questions, we don't have to do this in any, in any particular order. I wanted to put these three questions up, and you can respond to any one of them that you like, just like you have a little conversation here. One is, what are your reactions to the study, and what are the strengths and weaknesses or challenges that you might see? Uh, how can we best publicize a project? We have some ideas about that. And how can we best fund the project? We've uh, estimated about $52,000 for the cost of the project over the period of a year. We brought in some money, Eric's brought in some money, um, but we're still trying to think about ways to, uh, to address that need as well, so. Uh, Should I hand up? Uh, no, you can hear me. We can just talk, right? <laughs> okay. Loud enough, mouth. Uh, every time there is a private uh, initiative for a major public uh, problem, I have to ask the obvious, um, where the heck is the uh, Veterans Administration in this? Haven't they spent umpteen zillions of dollars in identifying everything from why there is more suicide to why there isn't better employment to homelessness to everything? How does this fit in to the national uh, discussion and uh, tax use of money for it? So the, the annual budget for the VA is about $200 billion. $200 billion. 
And it's still the case, given that $200 billion budgets, there's still 21 veterans that are committing suicide on a daily basis. So something obviously is not working in regarding what the VA, what the VA is doing. I think there are a couple of things that are going on there. One is there, and Tom and I have heard this quite a bit in our focus groups, there's a lack of trust with the VA, right? Um, it's a huge bureaucracy. So trying to get anything done in the VA can take months. I'll give you an example. So my grandfather is a Korean War veteran. He's, he's 88 right now, and he's developing serious dementia. And my dad is trying to get a, there's something called an aid and attendance benefit that you can get if you serve during wartime. The VA will give you a sort of a monthly stipend that can be used to, to pay for an assisted living care facility or nursing home or something like that. My dad's been working with the VA for six months and has yet to been able to get, he obviously qualifies. Everybody that my dad talks to on the phone says, your grandfather clear, clearly qualifies for this, right? But he can't get it because he has to go through all these loopholes. And that's, you know, my dad's a pretty high functioning adult. You take somebody who's coming back with PTSD, depression, a traumatic brain injury, something like that, trying to get through that system can be, can be a real issue. The other thing is that the VA tends to focus at the national and the state level. My hypothesis, and I, I'm hoping what we're going to be able to discover in the study, is that we can actually improve things for veterans by focusing on the county level. Right? We have a lot of resources in our community that can be marshaled to help these veterans. So rather than coming at it from sort of a top-down perspective, why not come at it from the bottom up? Every, every population of veterans in every county is unique, right? And every county is unique in the services that they have. So the VA is doing a lot, and I don't want to, you know, I don't want to badmouth the VA because they help a lot of people, right? But there's still obviously a problem there. So if we can't solve the problem just by coming at it from the top down, let's try to see what we can do from the bottom up as well. Tom, you want to? Yeah, I was just going to say, I think a lot of the time that the VA spends is, in a sense, putting out fires, you know, focusing on the big issues, right. trying to direct money to where they think it's best. But uh, as Eric suggested, many of those folks are administrators. I'm not knocking administrators, but there is a bureaucracy there. Um, and one, <coughs> I hope that one contribution we have in the study is when you focus on resilience, it's not just where are the problems, but asking a little deeper question, which is why is there a difference between people that end up with these issues and those that don't, like with right. the Brian Jacobs story? So again, uh, we've had a lot of vets tell us, I, I don't really trust the VA. Uh, we've had some that say, I don't even want to take the survey because I'm afraid somehow, some even, way. Yeah, even though we say yeah. it's a USF study, yeah. it's they're, not a VA study, they still won't take it. about it, honestly. Yeah. On the other hand, I do want to emphasize this. The last uh, Rotary Club that I spoke with, uh, Boo One invited me to talk to the um, Sunrise. Sarasota, uh, Sunrise. Sunrise. Yeah. And uh, there was a guy that came up to me, a big burly guy, and uh, he started to talk and then he couldn't speak. And you know, I said, you know, just take it easy for a few minutes, I'll come over and see you. And basically, after he settled down, he just simply wanted to say, the VA saved my life. He had been receiving counseling for 20 years from the VA. So they do, they do good, but they're, they're not a scholarly group, and they're not doing research on certain issues. So our hope is that um, we'll be able to inform decision-making with regard to, to where you can best point those dollars. Is it physical issues, mental, social relationships, environment? And then, just as importantly, What's the motivation of veterans to use those resources? Do you see what I'm saying? That's all. Are, the, are the resources there? That's one question. Another one is, do the vets know about those resources? And third, are they motivated to use them? So anyway, we've got a little model that we're trying to test that we think will answer those three questions and help better make